Um, the purpose of this talk is going to be to really talk for no more than half an hour um, about our vision for study skills, to try and give all of you a, a practical guide as to what it actually means, and more importantly, what it doesn't mean. Um, and then if there's any questions afterwards, then feel free, we can, we can absolutely discuss it. Uh, in terms of, let me just make my, uh, in terms of this evening, I want to just look at two really important things that impact on study skills, and it's really the yin and yang. They do support each other really well. And the first is to understand how our brain processes information and things that can help that and see things that can hinder that, um, habits that we can form that help. And then the second thing is once we understand how our brains work, what is it that we can do as human beings through habits and through actions that give us the best chance of understanding and performing well in examinations, uh, for example. So those are the two things we're going to cover this evening. Before we start, um, uh, the parents that are here have these actually printed out for them as hard copies, but we have just sent you about 15 minutes ago. So if you'd like to check your emails, Mrs. Lawton has sent you two resources. Um, the first is a poster. Um, and that is something that we would invite you, um, particularly if you've got boys in lower figures, upper figures or rudiments, to actually pin uh, on their bedroom door somewhere, because it is something that we will refer to as teachers regularly in, for example, have, uh, will have one of these. We're going through this mentoring program at the borders. Are you, are you no more. What could we possibly... Could I invite you please to mute yourself? Um, if you wouldn't mind, it makes it easier for everyone else to, to hear. Um, our boarders will be going through this program uh, tomorrow evening um, and they'll be given one of these, but I really would um, urge parents of boys in the upper school to print that out and, and leave it in your son's uh, bedroom or kitchen. Uh, and secondly, it's this book. Now, this book is a book that we've produced for the boys and it just gives a little bit of guidance to you as parents, um, a little bit of context as to what study skills is and the kind of habits we can form. But it also gives some practical guidance by way of planning activities that the boys can do in order to develop the skills. So um, I will refer during the course of this evening to both of these documents and you'll see how they, uh, how they take effect. Before we start, uh, I just wanted to um, give you a little bit of a task. Um, there's a number. It is, I think, a nine digit number. And I'd like you to see if you can memorize that. Um, I imagine the lawyers amongst you are reaching for a pen and writing it down now. Please don't cheat. But see if you can memorize that number. Um, OK, I'm going to give a few more seconds uh, and then We'll move on. So just three quick questions, and there's a reason for this. So um, if you're at home, you can discuss it amongst yourself. But our brain, uh, even my brain, creates enough energy to power something. Can you think what that might be? So every human brain creates enough energy to power a light bulb. In my case, I think it's a 15 watt. In some of the boys' cases, it's probably 100 watt. But all of our brains create enough energy and that's a really interesting point to, to reflect on for a minute that our brains have an incredible capacity and an incredible sense of energy flowing through them that needs feeding it needs understanding the second question is your brain represents just two percent of your body's weight but what percentage of oxygen does it use so if it's two percent of the body it's actually 20 percent of the body's oxygen so your son's living a healthy lifestyle, having a heart that pumps efficiently so that the brain can get the oxygen it needs when it needs is actually really critical. So an important part of study skills is actually leading a healthy lifestyle and making sure that when you need your heart to pump well, it can actually do that. And lastly, the brain is made up of how much oh, it's actually made yeah. up of seven. Really, can I just miss you to this meeting? It emphasizes the need to keep our brains and our minds hydrated. And that's something which boys typically aren't very good at. If you feel thirsty, you've left it too late because your body has already been dehydrated and you've already suffered the impacts of that. So drinking regularly is very important. Anyway, moving on. A lot of research has been done in the triggers and the factors that drive 
pupil achievement and particularly high achieving students. This research has been done across Canada, in America, in France, in Germany, in Australia, in India. It's been cross-cultural, it's been cr across languages. It is, these are habits that every single child who's growing up and being educated in the world experiences. And when they've done the research, what they found is that there are a number of factors which, when they come together, drive pupil achievement. Ironically, the first is one that doesn't, and that's IQ. So very often you might hear your son say, well, I'm not best at maths. I'm, I'm in the second set or I'm in the third set. Or I'm, actually, his potential to do well in an examination isn't driven by his natural IQ. It sounds incredibly counterintuitive. But when you see the results and the findings, it's very difficult to argue with. But what does, what are the tri triggers that will drive his ultimate success? Well, the ability to work hard, but not just working hard. I was a very good example at school of someone who revised incredibly hard for my examinations, but I didn't revise very efficiently. I spent a lot of time reading books, but none of it was going in. And the, and the mechanisms I used to revise were insufficient. So yes, I worked incredibly hard, but very inefficiently. So your son's progress and success is going to be built in part on the success of his study revision timetable. The fourth one, when I saw this, it was a bit of a hands to heaven moment thinking, ah, what a shame. But when you think about what it means, it's actually really important because the last thing we want to do at St. John's is spend terms and terms and weeks and months practicing examination questions with your son. We want to teach them new things. We want them to go on a voyage of discovery, not continually doing practice questions. But when you look at it from a different perspective, that if your son is going to revise and he's going to spend time going over that information, then he's best to spend his time actually doing practical examples of examinations rather than doing what I was doing, which was reading lots of books and being inefficient. So an effective way of preparing for an examination is actually practicing examination questions because that's how you own your skills. So, in those three things, numbers two, number three, and number four, what does that look like at St. John's and how do we begin to build those skills? Well, the first thing to understand is that revision cannot be done on its own. It can only come after effective learning. If I've been taught something and I've forgotten it, I can't revise it. I've got to relearn it and relearning is not revision. The word revision simply means to look at something, to see it again. So understanding that revision has to come on top of an effective learning program is really, really critical. And a lot of boys, a lot of children will, will have done it, forgotten it, and then try somehow to revise it. And that's when the trouble starts. So if you look at the poster that I've given you, it's, it's divided into four sections. And the first one is explaining to the boys how and why they have to create effective study habits. Because this forgetting curve is, is well established and well recognized in psychology. And what it tells us is that if you tell someone something, after a day, they will have forgotten 50% of it. After seven days, they'll have forgotten 90% of it. So your sons remembering more than 10% of what they've been taught over the term and being examined in week 10, they've got nothing that they can revise. Nothing, nothing reliable anyway. So trying to understand how do we ensure, and the reason the forgetting curve works like it does is because we tend to put stuff in our short-term memory. Some of you will have still remember that number I gave you at the beginning, but some of you will already have started to forget it. It's an example of short term memory. You haven't linked it to anything and therefore it's going to be forgotten. And that's how your son's learning works as well. So how do we take it from the short term shelf and put it onto the long term shelf? I know and I will never forget my wedding anniversary because it's on my long term shelf, but I will forget the name of my daughter's friend, for example, if I've only met her once. So there are things we do in life that prioritise and give us clues for memory. And that's what we want to try and work on with your sons. So the reason for that then is creating a habit. And if we work on a weekly, on a weekly basis, and for example, the boys at the end of their week, 
move on to, um, actually, I'll come back to that in a minute, it'll make more sense. But then going on to, how do we plan your son's time? And most pupils will come to the conversation terribly excited, thinking, right, I've got examinations, I'm going to do extremely well in these, these are my number one priority, and I'm going to spend three hours revising every day. And Monday goes well, Tuesday gets a bit boring, and by Wednesday it's gone down to half an hour. And the problem is they've gone into the program with such high expectations, but it hasn't been maintained. And the reason it hasn't been maintained is because as human beings, we need a sense of motivation. We need something in our lives that gives us that sense of impetus. So the first thing your sons must do in allocating their time is recognizing what makes them them, what re-energizes their batteries, what do they enjoy doing? And so making a list and saying, okay, what is important to me? And that conversation will very helpfully allow them to zone in on what, what, what isn't actually important to me and they prioritize. So that's the first thing. And, and getting them to use this, uh, this table is actually, I think, a really helpful thing to do. The second thing is then, and this has been, this was very successful with our Rudiments boys, I think last year, is then to get them to look at a normal week at school and think, well, okay, generally speaking, the vast majority of them at home at 5.30. Maybe if they're doing an activity, they're not. And then you start to say, well, okay, um, at 5.30, uh, I want to do my badminton. Uh, on, at 7.30, I want to play on PlayStation and play Minecraft with my friends, so I'm going to put that in because that's important for me. By the time they've done that, there is always, always a half hour block. block. When they've had tea and they've, and they've told you about their day, there is invariably a half hour every night. But if you let the boys just whittle away the time, you, they, they lose it. So creating a habit and what they can then do is say, right, that's my study period. That is when I'm going to work. And they commit to, to doing half an hour of high quality work, which isn't a great deal on the weekdays. They might want to have Wednesday where they say, well, I'm not going to do anything. We're just going to have a bit of a break. And then on Saturday, it's not hard to find an hour, an hour and a half in those big long days. So that's what they're trying to say. They put their badminton they put their playstation and then they find time for study and maintaining this manageable habit is the first thing that boys have got to do in terms of preparing their revision the second thing is then and this is the really really key thing going back to the forgetting curve if i'm a 12 year old boy i have just had upwards of 30 hours of lessons with my teachers that's an incredible amount of information I've got to remain retain. Now, assuming that some of that is going to be lost, going down to the bottom, the bottom quote, if you can't explain it simply, then you don't understand it well enough. If at the end of the week, what I would be encouraging your son to do is 15 minutes on all of his academic subjects, which can easily be allocated into those half hour blocks. He can do more if he wants, but a minimum of 15 minutes. And what he's doing is asking himself some very simple questions. He's got his book, which he's very organized. He's brought it home with him and he's going through his maths book and he comes across quadratic equations and thinks, yes, and he comes to you or his sister or even himself and he can explain it. He could teach it to someone. Tick. Doesn't need to be done. He's remembered it. That's the 10%. But he might come across differential numbers and think, ah, not sure on that. Don't think I can explain it. But he's got two options. It might be one of those subjects where he thinks, well, if I go through it again in a book, I'm probably going to be able to understand this. And so he does. His revision activity is to self-revise. If he does that and thinks, well, oh, really haven't got a clue where I'm starting, that's the start of the conversation he has with his teachers. And in the upper school, we organize something called the formation time for the boys. And it is um, 40 minutes to an hour of time when the teachers are available to your sons. But what we want to try and do is develop a habit where rather than your son going and saying, I don't understand differential numbers. And Mrs. Murphy saying, well, I've got 15 boys here and I've got five minutes for you. But she hasn't got time to do that. But if your son can come with his revision planner and say, but I understand the first bit, it's this bit that I don't understand. All of a sudden, something magical happens. Your son is now in a dialogue with your teachers, with his teachers. He's raising the profile of, actually, I want to learn and I'm organized. It raises the expectations of your son's teachers, for your son and your son walks away having been independent, but actively engaged in that lesson. 
the chances now, if he goes home and practicing it, of that going on his long-term memory is very, very different. So when he comes back to it in eight weeks, there's a much greater chance that he has got something to revise rather than a big black blank in his, in his, uh, in his revision plan. Now, it seems an overwhelming amount, but what we're trying to do is for your son to ask maybe three questions per subject. Do I, do I understand fronted adverb builds? Do I understand differential numbers or whatever it is? And then he can start, this is part of a, this is part of a bigger process and a bigger habit that is going to stand him in hugely good stead, not simply for doing examinations, but later in life when he's got deadlines and things he simply has to adjust to. And it, it tends to be the teenager's habit to put it off. If we give the boys work on Monday and say it isn't in for Friday, what, what they hear is, I don't have to do it till Thursday night. What they don't realize is the Thursday night in their, in their time, they haven't got time to do it on Thursday night. They got to do it tonight. So it, revision isn't simply about preparing for an examination next week. It's actually about living your life in a, in a, in a methodical way so that when you get these highs and lows of, of work that comes in and out, you can manage it. So I think the, the upshot of this is that I think when you mention revision to most boys and some parents, what they think is my own experience two weeks before an examination, that's when I start revision. That's fatal. And it's simply not going to work because your brain can't hold on to the information you need to revise. So there needs to be mini revision at the end of every week, putting it onto your long-term shelf and then coming two or three weeks later in order to revise. Uh, the fourth aspect um, is, uh, is a, an assignment planner. I'm not gonna to speak too much about that. That's pretty self-explanatory. That's if you're given a piece of work for a week's time. So just understanding a bit about our brain and how it works. Sleep is one of the most important things, drivers for academic success and revision. Talk to any psychologist, any sleep scientist, they will, they will say this. And the reason is our brain is made up of billions and billions and billions of neurons. And those neurons join together. And the point at where they join is called a synapse. And that is where information is stored. When your son learns how to do quadratic equations, that's because synapses have gone, they've made a connection and, and that information can travel from one part to the brain in a, in a, in a, again. But also your brain needs to give, have an opportunity for those synapses to settle down and for those memory links to be established. And if the brain can't have that regenerative cycle, then you're, the chance of you remembering things is significantly less. And, and, and MRI scans of brains have, have, have taught us this. So having an, an important sleep pattern is critical. Uh, there's two things that help us go to sleep and go and, and wake up. Melatonin in our brain is made is made uh, at the back of the brain, and that sends us to sleep. Um, and uh, and cortisol wakes us up. Now, this is something that I think is really important for all parents to recognise. And again, there's been an awful lot of research on this. That blue light is really really important for your son's sleep patterns because what blue light does in your kidney is it stimulates the uh, the creation of cortisol now cortisol is the chemical that um, that is generated in your body when your body wants you to wake up and 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 when boys and girls go into adolescence it's the making of cortisol and melatonin that goes out of sync that's why they want to go to bed much later and get up much later they're not being stroppy and difficult it's simply that's how their brain and their kidney are making these uh, these chemicals but the cortisol one if your son is looking at a computer screen and blue light half an hour before he goes to bed don't expect him to sleep well and sleep deeply. It's going to take him A, longer to get to sleep and B, longer to get to the deep sleep, the rapid eye movement type. So really, really important. And again, there's been lots of studies done on this. If you want your son to sleep well, then he then looking at blue light and computer screens and TV screens half an hour before is going to prevent that happening. And it's important for revision. The second thing, and this is important, particularly for boys in the middle school, this model of learning is absolutely critical. You can't learn effectively if you're not struggling. Simply to come to school and come home at the end of the day and say, oh, that was easy. The question has to be asked, well, then you haven't learned anything. 
And your sons come to St. John's because we want them to find it challenging. Not because we don't like them and we want to make life hard for them, but because they can't develop the study skills they need without having those kind of challenges. So having a resilient approach and helping your son become resilient in his studies. And if he doesn't, a good example was, was me, my, my, my father used to do my piano practice with me when I was young and he was tone deaf. And I always asked him to do, because whenever he asked me my scales, I always played C major because I could play C major and there were no sharps and flats. And he always used to think my, my scales were, were wonderful until one day my mother came and did it with me and, and rumbled it because I didn't want to play F sharp harmonic minor because I couldn't play it. And it was much easier to have an easier challenge. Your sons need to go through and face that kind of challenge where they recognize they find it hard, that is when their teachers are there to be able to develop that. So this whole um, mechanism of doing the study planner, then going and seeing your son's teachers, that's what drives their sense of motivation. So the fact that your son finds re revision hard should be a good thing, but if he's leaving it to the end, there's very little that we can do. And learning from failure, Doing poorly in an examination isn't in itself a complete disaster. But if that does happen, then we would expect a boy to be taking that and using that as his study planner for the next few weeks and having the ability to go to teachers, they'll go through the examination anyway, but going through if they don't understand it to make sure that when the next examination comes, right, he's, he's confident because he's actively involved and some of that information has made its way to his long-term memory. It helps them cope with stress. Um, pressure is good. Stress, I don't think, is. And therefore, if your son is stressed by examinations, then please tell a teacher, please tell us, get him to come and talk to us about it, and we'll walk through um, with him. Learning preferences. Now, this, this surprised me, because I think probably, personally, I'm more of a, a kinesthetic learner, so I'm, I'm probably in the, in the minority. But your son understanding his preferred learning style is terribly, terribly important because he should then focus when he has done all of his mini learning and then he comes two weeks before the examination to do his revision, his remembering and putting together. The word remember simply means remember to put together all of those bits. And that's what revision is supposed to be when he comes to remember all of that. He needs to find a way of remembering it in a way that plays to his strengths. Um, now, if he's a visual learner, then something like mind maps are a brilliant idea because what they do is take a visual picture of that particular um, of that particular mind map, and they can see the stems coming off and, and the links to X, Y, and Z. And some boys work really well with with mind mapping uh, mind mapping software. Others are more auditory. A good way to revise auditory is on your laptop to record yourself speaking the notes and to listen to them in the car or when you're going to sleep or learning them as a poem or anything like that. And kinesthetic is actually getting a pen out and drawing. Now, I think a lot of boys have an element of kinesthetic learning in them. And just a word of warning, if your son, if you see your son revising by reading a book, please step in because that is, that's proven on numerous occasions to be ineffectual. The problem is all it does is reinforce the, the short-term method. What he needs to do is find a way of understanding it or connecting it um, in, in, a, in a physical way. And very often writing out the notes again or drawing the mind map, that very nature of physically engaging your hands and eyes moving in, in sync are often enough to prove, to provide the, the, the physical or the cerebral stimulation to remember it. So understanding, uh, and there are, there are websites boys can go on to and we do it with them um, sometimes as well. So they can find their preferred learning style and then, and then we can help them with that. So there are different ways uh, and your son understanding his learning preference is very, very important. So mind mapping is, uh, is, is one way of doing that. Memory cards and sticky notes are another way of, uh, of memorizing it. These work well, but use as few words as you can on the, on the card. It doesn't help when there's 40 or 50 words. Boys simply don't remember it and then it just becomes a jumble. So seven to 10 words maximum and use different colors. Uh, very often writing in uh, different colors in alternate lines gives the boys a tracking process. Use highlighters for keywords. All of those kind of things are very, very, um, important for things like definitions 
or, or remembering essay plans. That's a really good way of remembering an essay plan. Um, and then finally, um, mnemonics and memorable images. So some of you might have remembered that, others might not. But if we were getting the boys, for example, to remember like that, then we tell them a story. The day was Tuesday, it was the second day of the week when Nicola walked to school. This was the first time she'd been allowed to do this. Her nine-year-old brother Hamish had been allowed to do this last year, but now that, she, now that she was eight, it was her turn. On the way, she met her friend Eliza, who was a teenager, age 13. They walked to school along the river, past the old baked bean factory. Baked beans, boys tend to remember those words very easily. Established 75 years ago by her great-grandfather, Alfonso, who died recently, age 95. You remember the story much more than you remember disconnected words. Now, this can be done with numbers. It can be done with essay plans. It can be done with all sorts of things. Boys enjoy creating <laughs> those stories, and they remember the plan. It isn't a complete panacea, because unless your son understands the importance of what he's got to put into that essay, then he's going to struggle anyway, but at least he remembers the order of the things that he's got to do as he raises them. Or it might be a mathematical equation and he's got to remember the order of that or whatever. Um, and things like that, the boys tend to remember uh, very well. Margaret Thatcher famously hardly ever read from a script and what she would do before she gave a speech was walk into whatever room and she would attach you know, the education policy to the chair and the, and the, and the um, ambulances to something else. And then she'd give her speech that way. And, but she was obviously a visual learner. If you're an auditory learner, then you've got to find a different mechanism for doing that. So there are lots of ways of remembering things, but the remembering doesn't work unless there's a level of understanding beforehand. Um, here are some revision books and online materials. We'll upload this um, tomorrow for all parents. So if you can't write these down now, please don't worry, we'll, we'll send them to you. But they are, they are ways of, um, of your sons becoming more independent. We will be revising with the boys for all of their examinations. A boy is never ever given an examination at St John's without being prepared both in terms of content and potentially how they might be go about preparing for it but in an age-appropriate way. The way we would support the rudiments boys is quantifiably different to the way for example we would support the year three boys but we're trying to take them through these developmental steps um, along the way but as your son gets into upper figures and rudiments it would be absolutely natural for him to want to take a little bit of responsibility for what he's doing um, and therefore say right I'm going to go and use the Gojimi map or the Memrise map for his French and that's absolutely fine encourage him uh, absolutely to do that. Um, practice exam papers um, and I know these are these are easily accessible by all parents uh, could I just please um, uh, Exercise, ask you to exercise caution in this because um, the examination papers that are available to you are exactly the same that are available to us as well. And it's hugely valuable for us to see how your sons do in a, in a mock paper. If you've done them all with your sons, it's very difficult for us to know what we need to go on, what, what he understands and what he doesn't, particularly if he's done it the week before. He might have revised it with you, but not been taught it, and therefore he can forget it. And we've seen one or two issues with that in the past. So by all means, if you want to get one set and, and use it as a kind of a, an aid memoir um, and the curriculum, then, then be my guest. But, but your son will sit the vast majority of those as part of his preparation with us during year six, sorry, with, during year seven um, and year eight. If you are going to start doing examinations like that, then can I suggest, unless your son's in rudiments, that you start with no time pressures. Because the most important thing is your son gets used to the rhythm of an examination and gives it his best shot and is able to get down everything that he needs. Because it's easier to improve his speed than develop his examination technique and knowledge. So let him get everything out and then we can gradually speed it up um, as, the time, as the time goes by. Right, look at that, spot on, half past. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you for, for joining us. I am just gonna ask now, um, Mr. Hutchinson Lawson, would you mind just um, unmuting everybody? Um, please forgive me if I, uh, if I don't, um, I, I think most of you are, are grayed out and turned your video cameras off, which is absolutely fine. Um, hopefully I'll know who you are if you ask a question, but are there any questions that parents would like to ask uh, now? Are you sure you've unmuted everyone this time? Yes, uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Barry, sorry, hello. Oh, good evening. Hi. Um, my quick question was just about your practice exam papers point. 
I wondered if perhaps if you knew which ones you may not be going through, perhaps if it, you could direct us to some example ones that we could use that we'd be safe not to be duplicating what you're doing with the boys. That's a good question, Mr. Barry. Absolutely, we can do that. Yes, um, I'll speak to the heads of department, um, have a meeting with them next week, and we'll communicate with you on that. No, thank you for raising that. That's a, that's a logical point to raise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Dorigo. Oh, hello, good evening there. I'm, I'm just wondering, um, I was listening about the part about revising styles and obviously this is different from child to child and I'm just really curious in knowing, you know, how, how do we find out which, which style suits our child best? That, that's where I am at the moment, trying to figure out which one for, for all of my children really um, is, is the best one. Um, well, I, I think just observing, um, in your case, Liam, and just seeing um, the, the kind of way he recalls information uh, would, would be one way. Um, asking him just to think about it. Very often the boys are, are instinctively aware of their optimal learning style when asked the question. They don't just use, they don't necessarily use it when they revise. But the other way, there are websites which, um, which we will encourage boys to, to use as part of the study skills program, which is running in the next few weeks. But if you wanted to do it with Liam over the weekend um, and you just put in Google preferred learning styles, there are lots of really helpful websites which get the boys to think about that kind of thing. Okay, that's great. Thank you very right. much. Um, Mr. Byrne. Oh, yes, good evening. A um, couple of points that you made really resonated with me. Um, one was not cramming revision and the other was building the habit and timetable for regular revision. I just wonder if the school would undertake to do a couple of things. One, one would be to circulate the revision guides that we typically get the day before half term uh, well in advance so that it isn't a last minute cram during the half term period. Um, and the other is to consider you know, reinstating the idea of having studies at, at school on a daily basis so that before the boys leave for home or go to supper, they'll have had a half hour to an hour um, study period. Uh, we, uh, we, we have looked at that and in fact we did we did it as a trial before lockdown um, but very few boys and in fact penny numbers sometimes two or three stayed and it wasn't something that seemed to be um, valued and speaking to a number of parents there was a feeling that they would rather an enriched activity program and our staff you know, there are finite resources and therefore if we take staff off to do studies and and I would want the staff involved if we were going to do studies there'd be no question of getting a TA or someone to do it you would want academic staff doing it then, then the impact is less breadth on uh, on the activities but the point you raise Mr Byrne is going to be an interesting one because uh, if you haven't already received a letter you'll get a letter from me very shortly looking at focus groups for activities and after school programs so that might be something um, that you want to raise through one of the people in that and we can we can absolutely look at it we're, we're open to it not against it at all. I just thought as it's an academic institution, um, it, you know, in my day at St. John's, it was a mandatory thing that happened every day. So we all got to uh, revisit um, the material that we'd learned that day or that week um, on a daily basis and um, went home ready for dinner or, or supper and uh, all boarders went on to activities um, and it seemed to work quite well. I just can't help but feel there's a, there's a place for that still. And um, and then, and then just on the point about the revision guides, uh, it really would be helpful if we started this whole process well in advance, because I do believe parents aren't always aware of what their children are studying at school during the week, because we don't always see, uh, we certainly don't see books come home, um, etc. So it uh, would be greatly helpful to us to not, not leave things to just before half term. So thank you. I, I think in a sense, the revision guides for the half term generally give the boys a structure of what's coming up in the examination. And we've no intention of doing that at the beginning of the term because that's what the boys will focus on and, and, we'll, and we'll rob them of a broader curriculum. So I think there's two things that need to happen hand in hand there and, um, and, and to ensure we're developing the boys' um, independence as well. Uh, but your point's taken and, and certainly sending it out a little bit earlier would, would be of value. I can see that. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Gupta. Hello, uh, good evening, and thanks evening. Mr. Charles, for such, such an informative session. It was really, really uh, uh, beneficial for all of us. Uh, I was just wondering that this type of an informative session, would you be having it with, with the boys as well? Uh, yes, we will. Um, our, our boarders, because we're in loco parentis, we are doing something additional with them on Thursday. And we're going through in particular detail this um, 
this this poster and the and the booklet. But we have a company called Elevate who will come in professional um, study skills people to come and, and introduce and uh, and zone in on particular skills that the boys are age appropriate. That's but then these are consolidated through the curriculum anyway. For example, Mr. Hutchinson Lawson is here with me this evening, but he will be drawing on some of those skills. Well, I didn't have lunch class, class, quite late, uh, so well. like Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? What did you say about Cosmo? Uh, I don't think that's a question Mr. Abernethy is asking, but um, okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate you joining us. I hope that's been of use um, to you, and it's been really nice to see some parents of, uh, of younger boys join us as well, because a lot of what I've spoken about has been largely focused on years six, seven, and eight, but it's absolutely the case that the work we need to do and the habits we need to form with boys in year three, four and five feed into this programme. Uh, and, and Mr Snell and his, his team are acutely aware of that and trying to ensure that that's embedded in the things the boys are doing now uh, as well. So, um, Mr Hutchinson, sorry. There's two questions from, uh, I think, Sarah's iPhone. Oh, sorry, um, Sarah's iPhone. I don't know which Sarah that would be. Excuse me. Oh, hi, it's Sarah Dunson. Oh, hello, Ms Dunson. Hi. Um, I know this is mainly aimed at the boys um, in the upper years, but I was just wondering, um, are they going to do the CAT tests and what preparation you might do for that? Very good question. Thank you for asking it, Mr. Dunson. Um, the CAT test, the, the Cognitive Ability Test Scores, um, those have already been sat. Um, they were sat uh, the week before last online. Oh, really? And, uh, yes, but oh, don't God. worry, because George, don't worry, George is, uh, isn't old enough, isn't, uh, he's um, too young to sit those tests at the moment. They start in year four, and okay. we are expecting those results um, in, in a few weeks' time. Um, but, but no, uh, to answer your question, Mrs Gunson, we don't revise for those. They're tests that, that can't be reliably revised for, and if we do, um, if we prepare the boys for that, then we can't use the standardised results um, for secondary school applications. Right. Okay. Okay. That's... Thank you. Is that, is that all your questions? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Um, Mr. Abernethy, um, was there a question you'd like to ask? No. Nope. Okay. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for taking the time to join. A particular thank you to those who have, have, have struggled uphill um, to be here. I hope it's been, I hope it's been worth it. It's been really lovely to have people in the room, but more importantly, it's been able, good to be able to talk, talk you through this, um, this programme. If you've got any questions that you want to email me with individually, then please obviously feel free um, to do so. And if you are the uh, parent of a boarder, please rest assured this is something now that we're going to be starting in, in, in quite some detail with the boys and supporting them in their, in their small mentoring tutor groups as well. So um, I wish you all a very happy evening and thank you for joining me. God bless.